If I may quote from James Stockdale's memorable opening line from the 1992 vice presidential debate, who am I and why am I here? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked. I'm Henry Fortunato, director of public affairs for the Kansas City Public Library, and I am here for the same reason all of you are here to engage in a public conversation with presidential debate master moderator Jim Lehrer, AKA executive editor and former anchor for the PBS NewsHour. Conducting this conversation is everyone's favorite library director, Crosby Camper III. And joining us is Lee Banville, former managing editor of the online NewsHour and now a professor of journalism at the University of Montana. But before I tell you a little more about tonight's program, I'd like to briefly pass the baton to Dr. Wayne Vaught, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at UMKC, who will offer brief remarks on how this whole event came together. Please welcome Dean Vaught. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm, uh, again, Wayne Vaught, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at UMKC, and we're just thrilled to really to be part of this opportunity to bring an internationally recognized uh, journalist and highly influential uh, member of our community to Kansas City uh, to, to speak with us tonight. Uh, UMKC uh, is very lucky to be able to partner in this uh, venture. Uh, bringing together two enduring Kansas City institutions, obviously the Kansas City Public Library and the University of Missouri, Kansas City, which is in its 80th year uh, beginning this year. Uh, UMKC and the College of Arts and Sciences, and in particular the Office of Continuing Education, had worked uh, diligently together to bring this, uh, to this opportunity uh, for you this evening. Uh, so that's why we're really proud to be a uh, part of this venture uh, and involved in sponsoring and helping uh, bringing Jim uh, here with you tonight. So I'm going to turn this back to you, Henry. Okay, thank you, Dean. Um, it's time to get this show on the road. So very briefly, Jim Lair is one of those rarefied individuals who needs no introduction, but... Let me give you one anyway. Um, yeah, I'm paid by the word, you know. <laughs> In the rest of the country, Jim Lair is known as a PBS correspondent par excellence, primarily through his connection with the various iterations of the PBS NewsHour that began in the mid-1970s. And for those of us who don't watch PBS, for moderating an amazing 12 presidential and vice presidential debates. But here in the heartland, we should also make note of Jim Lehrer's Wichita roots and his bachelor's degree in journalism from Mizzou. <clears throat> he is the author of many, many books, of which the most recent, or I think the most recent, I'm not totally up to speed on that, is Tension City, a phrase uh, that derives from the first President Bush's uh, analysis and uh, uh, feelings about what it was like to be in a debate situation. Tension City is a memoir and analysis of those presidential debates since 1976. Afterwards, Tension City will be for sale, courtesy of our friends at Reading Reptile, and Jim will be signing copies. It's going to be a bit complicated, but I'll come back on and explain how that's going to work. Lee Banville is one of the pioneers of new media. His background goes back to the time when new media actually was new, i.e. the early 1990s. For more than 13 years, he invented and then reinvented and then reinvented again the online news hour for PBS, eventually taking over complete authority for its operations. Along the way, he managed online coverage of seven national election cycles, eight national political co uh, conventions, the Iraq War, 9-11, and just about everything else that occurred in the Clinton administration and the second Bush presidency. 
He is now an assistant professor at the School of Journalism at the University of Montana, where he's also involved in Patchwork Nation, a new media reporting project that offers a new way of looking at red state and blue state America. He's also the author of a multimedia enhanced ebook on the history of presidential debates called Debating Our Destiny. As for Crosby Kemper III, my dear friend and esteemed colleague, all I can tell you is this. Tension City would also be a good title for what's been going on at the library the last few days. Actually, it's a good title for what goes on at the library every day, especially today, but I digress. What I'm trying to say is this. Crosby has driven certain library staffers to the point of distraction requesting every single book Jim Lehrer has ever written. <laughs> All to a good cause because Crosby would read every single one of them. You'll see that in tonight's conversation. But before that begins, we want to offer you a few clips from previous presidential debates that are part of Lee Banville's Debating Our Destiny ebook. <laughs> well, so you know, one other thing I want to say about Jim Lehrer, in, in one of his memoirs, um, there's this great little um, notion, a great little uh, remembrance of uh, when his uh, parents ran a bus line in uh, central Kansas, and um, uh, he was part of that operation, even though he was only 12, and uh, because of some things that he said, he got the nickname of Mr. Big Mouth. And, and in his memoir, uh, he says, um, this was probably a good thing for the business I decided to go into. Okay, so um, I think we're just about set up, and so I would like to ask you to please welcome Crosby Kemper. Evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Jim Lehrer from Wichita, Kansas, educated at the University of Missouri Journalism School, a true son of the great Midwest, despite his Texas accent, <laughs> has moderated 12 presidential debates, uh, more than anyone else, uh, written Tension City about the history, purpose, and experience of those debates, collaborated with Professor Lee Banville of the University of Montana on a multimedia electronic book, Debating Our Destiny, which includes the video inter interviews with presidential historians such as Richard Norton Smith, Michael Beschloss, Janet Brown of the Presidential Debate Commission, and some debaters, notably both Presidents Bush, Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, Gerald Ford, John Kerry, and Michael Dukakis. Jim and I are both emeritus trustees of Monticello and uh, have this, uh, the unique distinction of having interviewed the same president, Thomas Jefferson. Jim is a little older than I am, so he got him in his prime. I got him in the oh. retirement years. <laughs> but let me fast forward from Jefferson to the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Uh, <laughs> here, 100 years, 75 years. Uh, the, the, the origins of the presidential debates really come from, from the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And, and, and though they weren't running for president, they were running for the Senate. It, they ultimately became part of the presidential debate of 1860. But my question isn't about those debates, it's why it took so long for the presidential debates to become a part of our culture. Uh, in the next presidential debate, or the next debate that's like, that is a presidential debate is, is in, in 1960, the Kennedy-Nixon debate. And then it took us another 16 years uh, to get to where we are today, where we assume the inevitability of presidential debates. What changed? What, why, why is it inevitable now? Well, uh, television. That's what changed. Television is, um, is what caused the, the first nationally televised presidential debate. You had to have television, obviously, for that to happen. But nobody really thought about it uh, as, a, as an event until television was available. And that, of course, was Kennedy, uh, Kennedy Nixon. And um, people wanted to see them in addition to hearing them. You could have done it on the radio. But nobody, for some reason, it never got suggested, or if it did get, get suggested, it never got uh, accepted. So uh, I don't know why, I don't know what the history is. Do you, Lee, do you know why, why it took so long for, for uh, was, it, was, it, was it something Mr. Jefferson said in an interview with? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, I mean, as a, as a graduate of Jefferson's alma mater, uh, the original one, William and Mary, um, no. 
Uh, it actually had to do with, um, I mean, you're right, it was essentially the evolution of television. I mean, there were some uh, efforts at, at a radio debate for the, Republican primar for the Republican primary in Oregon in 1948, which was the first really a real effort at having a, uh, uh, a sort of primary debate. Might have been um, Harold Stassen's performance that uh, put the kibosh. No, like, no Dewey trauma, no... Wilkie no, challenged, Wilkie challenged uh, right. Roosevelt, but he refused yeah. to debate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, I mean, and I think part of it was also the primary process, right? I mean, it was a very closed process for a very long time, so the idea of having an open debate um, to select uh, a candidate in the primary didn't make sense, and so as that opened up, that, that drew um, more and more candidates into the primary concept of a debate. Um, but then it wasn't until really television was significant enough that it actually drove a national televised debate. And, and then because television become, has become so important, and you've talked about this, it changes the nature of the, of the campaign and the nature of the candidates. You have to be good on television. If you're not good on television, you can't be a presidential candidate. Is that true? You have to be good or you have to be perceived as being good. Uh, and, and there's a difference. The, uh, the Kennedy-Nixon debate, uh, Al Gore and uh, George W. Bush in, uh, uh, in 2000, uh, there have been, in uh, 2008, and less so in 2012, those are three sets of debates, or three uh, specific debates in some cases, where the television, the fact of television made a difference because I've always believed that these debates are less about substance. Uh, by the time you get to these, I'm talking about contemporary debates now, by the time you get there, um, it's usually a month before the election, most everybody's made a decision between Sammy Sue and Billy Bob, oh well, I'm in favor of this person, of, of Billy Bob's social security plan, I'm against, whatever. They've, they've gone through the campaign. So what you do, what you want to see on television between or among the candidates, if there are more than two, and it has been a couple of times, you want to see who these people are. You want to take the measure of the individual. And you can only do that, doesn't matter what they're talking about. What's, the color, what's your favorite color tie? You say, well, blue, oh, I like red. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you learn something. You learn something about the individual. And, um, uh, so, uh, there are, as you know, there are all kinds of uh, examples where a, a, a Kennedy Nixon is a perfect example. People who listened to that on the radio thought Nixon won. People saw it on television thought Kennedy won. 2000, first debate, Al Gore, George W. Bush, exactly the same thing happened. 2008, uh, 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 John McCain and uh, Barack Obama, first debate. A lot of that was perceived that way as well. But it was what they projected as individuals, how people saw these people, that, that made the difference, well, not what they said you, necessarily. In, in, the, in the book, you've got an interview with uh, President Bush, uh, President Bush Sr., uh, in, in which he says that it's show business uh, and it's uh, style over substance. And, and, uh, he w and he also says maybe he didn't like the debates because he wasn't very good at them. But uh, the, the, no the notion that this might, might be uh, you know, not more, more style than, uh, than, than revelation of character. My favorite, my favorite interview that I did with candidates afterward about the debates was with George H. W. Bush. It was about seven years after he left the White House. And it was down at his... Um, uh, library in, uh, in uh, College Station, Texas. And I was doing a taped interview for the documentary, Debating Our Destiny. And there were two cameras sitting like this. We were sitting like this, one camera there, one camera here. It was all for tape, and we would edit and all that sort of stuff. And so I asked him, you remember the, the incident when he looked at his watch? George A., some of you may be old enough to remember George A. W. Bush. <laughs> and George A., when he looked at his watch during a debate with Bill Clinton, and um, um, Ross Perot. At any rate, this really, the world came down hard on George A. W. Bush because of that. And he drew a lot of criticism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I asked a hard hitting question when I did my interview with him seven years later. A question like, Mr. President, what was that all about? You know, something like that. And he said, and he, he kind of leaned forward, kind of almost leapt at me. And he said, yeah, I looked at my watch. 
You know what that means? Anybody who looks at their watch during the presidential debate clearly isn't qualified to be president of the United States. <laughs> I, I thought, oh my God. And I, 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 I waited a few seconds and I said, uh, well, uh, Mr. President, uh, some people suggested that uh, you looked at your watch because you were kind of ready for this thing to get over. He said, you're damn right. <laughs> I looked at my watch and I said, oh, how much more time do we have for this crap? <laughs> and he leans across. Now, keep in mind, the cameras are running. Both these cameras are running. He leans across and he says, and you can put that in your documentary, Jim. And I said, Mr. President, we just did. <laughs> anyhow, he hated those debates. And he, uh, if he had his way, there wouldn't be any debates. But he didn't have his way because by then, uh, he, and just like now, there's no way in the world any nominee, major, major candidate for a candidate for a major party for president could avoid uh, participating in one of these debates. LBJ was able to avoid it because there was actually a law in the books that, that said you had to have every candidate, anybody declared candidate, uh, and, the, and, and Congress had to pass an exception for the Kennedy-Nixon debates and for any future debates, and LBJ made sure that the, uh, I believe I'm right in this, that the Congress wouldn't pass such right. an exception. Absolutely right, absolutely right, yeah. Uh, exception, yeah. yeah. Uh, Bill, Bill Clinton made the point in one of your, your interviews that, uh, uh, that though they are a revelation of character, that you do find out things, this, uh, this sort of uh, self-description uh, of, of people's character. There are also things that you don't know about the candidates, and, and, and do you worry about that? He said, uh, you don't know if they're going to pick good people from what you can tell in a debate. You don't know if they're going to organize the government well. Do you, get, do you worry that the revelation of character in the debates is partial? Yeah. Well, Clinton, uh, the interview I did with Clinton about the debates, I mean, if he had his way, he'd still, he and I'd still be talking about it. <laughs> He loved talking about it. I mean, for him, it was like talking shop. He was very non-political in, in his discussion. And the point that he made about the watch, for instance, he said, well, the only reason that hurt George A. He said, ah, if I'd looked at my watch or Ross Perot had looked at his watch, nobody would have paid any attention. Nobody would have cared. The only reason it mattered, because it was already in the wind, because this man, George H. W. Bush, couldn't make a a grocery checkout machine work. Remember the, the, the scanner thing? He was disconnected from the American people. And he said that the reason that hurt him was because it was a confirming thing. And he said most of these, quote, gaffes, this was Clinton talking now, right. most of these gaffes were only were gaffes because they were perceived to be confirming of something that was already in the wind. Michael Dukakis. Uh, you know, Mr. Bernie, Bernie Shaw. Bernie uh, Shaw. Yeah. And you know, Mr. Cole Fish. He proved it, at least to the to the voters. It's the qu question about uh, it, to, from Bernie Shaw. The first question of that debate uh, about whether what he would do uh, about the death penalty if his wife Kitty Dukakis was raped and murdered. Yeah, and he did a little tangent on the uh, pros and cons of capital punishment. And, 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 uh, he, and he should have showed emotion. Should have showed, well, he should have. He, that's what everybody said. And uh, I asked Dukakis and George H. W. Bush about that in my interviews with them. Dukakis, to this, this was a lot, I can't remember how, how much longer it was after the, uh, after the campaign when I asked him, but he, he realized, he said, look, I've been talking about capital punishment and the crime issue since, since I was governor of Massachusetts. And I just thought, I, he said, my, the little Rolodex went through, okay, this is about capital punishment. I wasn't thinking in, in personal emotional terms. And uh, he was not willing to concede, at least in the interview with me, that, that, that his failure to handle that in an emotional way cost him the election. George H.W. Bush, I asked him if he thought that cost, that won it for him, in other words, just the opposite. And he said, yeah, I think so. I think it probably did. Be but, but he made, the, he didn't attribute it to uh, Clinton, obviously, but he, he made the same point that it was, it was a confirming thing. And uh, it was a negative. It confirmed a negative. Right. It, you used a phrase uh, in, in Tension City about the magnifying effect of, uh, of the debate or of moments like this. Do you worry as a moderator that, that one thing, that it may be confirming of something, but it may get, it may get out of control, it may, may be much bigger than, than it really ought to be? Absolutely. In fact, it's the thing for me, it's the single most uh, uh, aching worry there is. 
uh, because I know it can happen. And it could be, it could be something that uh, you, no matter how wonderful the moderator, let's just say for discussion purposes, the moderator's fabulous, okay? <laughs> All right, just for, just, it, it could it, happen. Just, it could yeah. happen. It could happen. And he or she does everything absolutely perfectly. Something could still happen that could turn the election. And everybody involved knows that. Everybody who's watching, everybody who's working on the, micro, on the, on the sound system, everybody who's handing out tickets, everybody who is a candidate, everybody who's advising a candidate, every reporter, every moderator, every whatever. And that's the reason it's so difficult. Yeah. And it's so, and for, me, and for the moderator, the one thing I always, every, 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 before every one of those things started, I would just say, please, please, whatever else you do, to me, to myself, I'd go to the, not literally to the mirror, but essentially, please don't do anything so stupid that causes this election to go one way or another. In other words, that they can't blame it on me, whatever And, and do, you, do you think you ever have done that, or you've not? Oh, certainly not. <laughs> well, that was easy. Wait, Lee, do you know, ever recall a time when I did something that caused the election to go, that, that I made a mistake or anything? No, see, no. you didn't even. Right, yeah. <laughs> no, you're a brilliant questioner, too. Uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it, it, there's that famous uh, moment uh, in, in, in the first debate of the modern era, the Ford Carter debate, where Gerald Ford liberated Eastern Europe, uh, you know, which the Eastern Europeans didn't know, so a little speak. prematurely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and the, I forget who the moderator was. Was it Edwin Newman or uh, uh, Turwitt? Uh, it was Frankel, Max Frankel, the New York Max Times. Max Frankel, sorry. Asked the follow-up. And, and, and yeah, and he, he, he wanted to, to get him to correct it. Yeah, I think he asked him a follow-up question. You really mean that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But of yeah. course, I, I mean but that. In that well, case, uh, here again, I asked both uh, Carter and uh, Ford how important they thought that was, and F Ford said, "Hey, look, when we started that campaign, I was 17 points behind because of the, the Nixon pardon." And we were three points, seven, I don't know, what was it? do you remember the, it was three or four points, he had caught up. Yeah, he was, he was, he was back, right. uh, but he was three points back. Yeah. Three points back. the first back. debate happened. Yeah. When, yeah. And, uh, well, and that was the second debate. That actually. was the second debate. He when actually he picked did, up steam in the picked first Picked up debate. steam. Yeah. And what, that, what, what his, his um, uh, uh, Eastern Europe thing did was kind of sit yeah. on the, the, uh, yeah. the, the, uh, his momentum. But he said, look, there's so many reasons why people vote for, th for vote for or against a candidate. I just don't. I just don't think it. It was the reason for uh, uh, for my losing. And um, Jimmy Carter uh, said exactly the same thing. That there, because Jimmy Carter, of course, didn't want to. Did he, he? He knew that Gerald Ford had made a mistake, and it was a serious mistake. But there, there. When you look at it, there are all kinds of reasons why people vote. A certain way, and my experience with these debates is that it's you're talking about a very small sliver of the electorate that actually make a decision cold because of a debate, because of something that happened in a debate. People are already leaning one way or another. Ninety percent of the people have already decided for whom they're going to vote. So what they watch the debate for is is to either be have a confirming experience with your candidate or to get the feel for the other person, because one of these two people might even be the other guy's going to win instead of your, your person. So you want to get a feel for the, who the next president's going to be. So. Well, and, and there is a debate in, in, the, in, the, in the last election. There was, there was a, a debate about the debates, and particularly after the first debate when uh, Nate Silver uh, came out and said he, Barack Obama's still ahead. The debate didn't have that big an effect. Uh, a lot of people on the other side, and a lot of, a lot of uh, debate watchers uh, felt that uh, Romney had won the debate and that he was catching up and that he, he may, might have passed the president at that point. Do you think that, de that debate made a big difference or not? I do think it made a big difference. I think, but it made a big difference all kinds of ways. I think that, uh, now see, see what you think about this, Lee. My, my, my theory, not theory, my thesis on this was that, first of all, Obama was ahead of Romney, but not much, but not by much, when that first debate happened. And um, the, the instant polls, you know, the polls that, uh, you know, that, that happened within, say, 24 hours, showed that, that, that Romney won that debate two to one, or, or, or Obama lost it two to one, or whatever. And there was a marked 
change in the po overall polls uh, for the, between the two. But then, then they had a second debate, and then they had a third debate, and uh, Obama reacted to the negative reaction, the negative reaction to the first, and he became a much more skilled candidate. As a result of that, he was coasting up till then, and this caused it got his attention, to put it mildly, and he did much better. And as a result of that, we have the outcome that we have. Do you, will, you, will you buy that? If you if you just you know feel free to disagree with me, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no, I think that's right. I think that what, what, um, what, what the first debate did was it, it recast the Romney campaign. Because the Romney campaign, if you think about September in particular, they were not having a good month, right? I mean, first there had been the, the uh, Benghazi attack and the, their statement about that, that had sort of blown, well, that's a poor... Uh, that had gone, that had caused a PR mess for them. And then there was a president, week. President, president said, shoot first, aim later. Correct. Which was a good line. Uh, yeah. And then the next week, I mean, literally the next week, it was the 47% video comes out from Mother Jones. Um, and then about a week later is the first debate. So the Romney campaign is really struggling at this point. So they need something to gain traction, something to change the conversation. And then uh, the Obama campaign, even though they'd really, um, and it speaks to this desire to set expectations, there was a really concerted effort to drive down the expectations of the president. Um, Jim Messina, who was the campaign chair, put out a memo saying, you know, look, I mean, I watched the debates and, and Romney won 20 of them in the uh, primary. You know, he's a good debater, and my guy hasn't debated anybody since, you know, 2000. Uh, eight, so don't, don't assume he's going to do well. But still, you know, 65% of the public thought he was going to win that first debate. You know, a quarter of all Republicans thought he was going to win all, that first debate. And he comes in and he's really flat and it shakes up the campaign. Then, you're right, I mean, the Obama campaign, you know, snaps too and really kind of... And Obama himself it. did. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Kind of like you, uh, Reagan in 84. It's in true. Exactly. You, you, you talk, I, I like to draw a contrast with, with President Obama's reaction to his bad performance. And it's described by you, I think, in, uh, or, or maybe you're quoting somebody in, in, in one of the books, uh, as an Eddie Haskell uh, moment where he's pro professorial and patronizing and no one really likes that attitude. And Al Gore was sort of like that in the first uh, debate that you moderated uh, uh, with President, uh, then Governor Bush, uh, Bush 43. Um, and, and, and you talk about how Gore, Gore changed too. In fact, he changed in each one of the debates, but, but he, didn't, he didn't necessarily Understand what was what was wrong, and uh, can you, you you talk about being three different people, three right. different personalities, really, in the three debates? When when that debate was over, the third of the three it was in St. Louis, and I had moderated all of those, the first all three of those. The first one was in Boston, the second one I was in North Carolina, and then the third one was in St. Louis. And on the stage, that was before security was so severe. Everybody could kind of gather on the stage, the candidates and the families and everything. And Gore said to me, he said, well, I win the first debate. He, he used the, the kind of uh, three, uh, uh, what is it, the, the uh, uh, he, it was, I was too cold, too hot, and the third one I was just right. And, oh, right, and, uh, the three bears. Or yeah. Three bears, three bears. <laughs> Goldilocks. <laughs> You're a professor, you should help me out on this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on the nursery rhymes, for goodness sake. Um, uh, and and uh, that's exactly what happened. But see what, but he was felt really good that he'd done well in the third debate, but he was a different person in each one of those debates. He, did very, he, he felt he did very poorly in the first one, and all of his, uh, and, he, and, and Saturday Night Live made great fun of him, and they made him, his advisors made him look at, at the Saturday, Saturday Night, Night Live, Live yeah. which made him more uptight. And then so he, he, because he, uh, he was, uh, you remember he was sighing and grimacing, oh, oh, yeah, and <laughs> do that again, you really do that well. Yeah, right, see. And, uh, uh, the and then there's the moment that we, we showed that where, where he, he almost attacks uh, oh, yeah. uh, George that W. Was <laughs> the, that was in the third debate yeah, in St. Uh, Louis. Yeah. And, 
And uh, I was sitting on it, you know, they, they, were, they, were, they were over here, and I'd say I was sitting right here, and Gore starts walking right toward <laughs> Bush. And, you know, I take great pride in the fact that I, I really do prepare for every eventuality. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, holy Moses. He's That's an added head, transcript, he's gonna by the way. Head butt George W. Bush, right there in front of 65 million people. <laughs> and what am I going to do about it? He said, Excuse me? You know, don't do that. But at any rate, what was so wonderful about it, and it's why it hurt him in the long run, was that uh, Gore was uh, that Bush saw him coming. You saw, you saw the yeah, shot. Yeah. He just kind of looked at him and kept talking. <laughs> and kind of sidestepped it, and it, uh, it didn't work. But, but the, the important thing here, the message in that, 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 that anybody in public life should carry from that, is you just be one person yourself. Right. And don't, don't be a different person each candidate, each, 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 each event. Oh, be this, be this, be that. And I think that's what happened to Al Gore. And, uh, and I think he knows it. Yeah, and, he's, and he, wouldn't, he didn't talk to you for the, for the book, uh, either the books, and, and hasn't written uh, about it. And that, that's kind of, kind of interesting. That yeah, I think he's, well, my theory about it, he was about the only candidate. Ross Perot was another. But they were the only two who just declined to talk to me for the, now over a period of 20 years now for, these, uh, for the documentaries and, and, and for debating our destiny. And uh, in Gore's case, I think uh, my theory on this is that he, 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 still has some, he still has some anger and some sore uh, left over from 2000. And uh, that to even talk about the debates, he'd have to talk about that. The whole he election. Want to do that. And, uh, yeah. He wants to do it on his own terms. Right. He doesn't want to trickle it out. And I think someday he will write a book about but, it. And now, Ross Perot wouldn't talk to you, maybe because you made him a character in your, your novel, The so Last Debate. That was a really smart move la, on la, last, <laughs> last debate. Apparently, he, uh, he objected to your portrayal of him. He objected. So he called me on the phone and uh, just really, really was not happy. He said, you made fun of me. You made fun of me. And you, you know, blah, blah, blah. I thought you were my friend. Because I knew him in Dallas. And, uh, and he... Uh, 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 at any rate, he never forgave me. And uh, I ran, ran into him recently at a public library event. Very uh, good. Similar to this at, in Dallas. And uh, he was very nice to me and all of that. And I was working on Tension City. And I said to him, I, I'd like to call you and uh, talk to you about the debates. And he said, okay. So I called him two or three days later. He took the call. And, uh, and I said, you know, I, I really... First of all, I'm sorry about, you know, I understand why you're angry with me. That was many years ago, but I understand completely. That was stupid of me. I regret that. I'm so sorry. You I portrayed him as a talk show host who was thrown off the air. Yeah. The well, you know what the... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why he thought that was a negative thing. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, at any rate, um, he said, no, I don't want to talk about it. And I, so I kept saying that, and he finally said, Jim, I'm not going to talk about it. And that was the end of it. And I did finally write him a note. And I should, I should, I should have written years ago, apologized for it and all of that. And uh, I've talked to his son since then. He was a terrific guy. He and I are very, you know, very friendly and all of that. And I'm not saying Ross and Perot and I are not. I just, mis, I just mis, mistreated him. And uh, I, he deserves my wrath. No. <laughs> I deserve his oh, wrath. Yeah. I do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, the, the role of the moderator, you, you, you say uh, at, at one point that uh, uh, the, the questions aren't as important as, as the answers, and, and, uh, and you're not there to, to show off. How do you go about preparing as, the, as a moderator to get those questions uh, that, that you know will get the, the good answers and, and not intrude yourself into uh, the process? Well, that's the hardest game. That's the hardest game there is. Uh, in the uh, 2012 debate, uh, Obama and uh, Romney, my preparation was aimed solely toward getting them to talk to each other. I was less, I spent less time thinking about specific questions I would ask, uh, and more time getting in my head what I needed to know about 
I was saying I prepared more for subjects than I did for questions. And my aim was... So you didn't actually have specific no, questions? I did. I, did you have, had, I had plenty you did. of specific questions. But more questions than you used, obviously. Exactly. And they were not designed to be read. They were designed to help me think in terms of question. When I, if I needed to ask a question, I'd already, I was, I was, it was, I'd already gone through the process. Because I'm still a writer, first and foremost. Until they go through my fingers, I don't really have them. And so just writing them all down was very helpful to me. But they were not designed to, as they are in the early other formats, where you have two minutes of this and a minute and a half answer and a this and a response, when everything is very carefully um, controlled. Uh, and that is the result of the negotiations between the commission and the candidates. That had the, the moderator has nothing to do with what the, what the, moderate, what the uh, format's going to be. But in this one, the whole intent of the debate commission, and the candidates agreed, was to let's see if we can have a real debate where they talk to each other, and uh, uh, and that's what happened. It was hard. It was difficult getting there, and it was. You tried to do that with Obama and yeah. McCain, would and, work. You, and you couldn't get. You kept asking them to talk to each other, and and they wouldn't do it, and asking them and asking them. And finally, John McCain said, "Do you think I can't hear him?" Yeah, right. I made a I made a complete fool of myself. I finally just gave up. But but, but then but then with the 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 uh, Obama Romney, uh, there is some view. Uh, the New York Times wrote a critical review, and uh, and some of the blogsters uh, that uh, that Romney took over the town hall format in the first debate, and and ran over you and ran over the president and and. So did it, but it did work from your point of view. The, oh, absolutely, it worked. Um, at the, uh, you know, it's very easy to, uh, not easy, but I mean, I've, I've, I've done it often enough. I know how to stop people from talking. Uh, I mean, that's what I do for a living. And I could easily have stepped in and stopped these guys from talking. But, and at the beginning, I did. And then I realized, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. They're talking to each other. So I backed off. Yeah, I caught some heat for that. Most of that's gone away. People realized, uh, uh, and particularly, the, most of the heat I got was from, from that, that came to, to me or to the commission or the format uh, was uh, from people who felt that, uh, who were, who were pro-Obama. Right. Who, the, who blamed me or the format or the debate commission uh, for Obama's uh, doing so poorly in that debate. Once people came, and came to their senses, realized, hey, wait a minute, takes two to tango and whatever. But I consciously backed off, backed off and let him go. Uh, the frustration for me in that debate was that as a result of that, you just, I had to cut from the bottom. And I had to, you know, some subjects that I wanted to get to, like immigration or all kinds of other things, because uh, I had domestic policy in that first debate, I just, I didn't get to them because uh, but, uh, but I, I, my, my criteria was, as long as they were talking about things that mattered, and they were talking to each other, let them go. And uh, some people thought that I have lost control, that, they, that Romney ran over me and all that sort of stuff. People are free to say whatever they want to and uh, think whatever they want to. But the fact of the matter is, you may not have liked what happened, but that's what I, that's what I intended. It was pretty interesting to see the, physically what happened in this debate with the, with the way both the candidates moved around. And President Obama was having a hard time moving around in that, in that debate and then didn't have much of a hard time. He was very, very mobile in the, in the next debates. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, to me, looking at the debates, there's, there's always a contrast in the, the candidate, between the candidates who are really at ease and the candidates who are not at ease. And maybe the best contrast uh, would, would be someone like Ronald Reagan, uh, maybe in, particularly in the, the second debate with, uh, with Mondale, Vice President Mondale, how at ease he was with himself in making the joke that, that you showed, versus John McCain uh, in, the, in, the, in the, the first uh, uh, McCain-Obama debate where he's so nervous during the whole thing, he's fidgety. And I, I just wa wondered if you have a, a, an analysis of that or a, a thought about that. I mean, here's John McCain, who after all, you know, he, he, he was used to getting questions from North Vietnamese uh, uh, jailers uh, who would break his arms if he gave the wrong question. And I don't think you've ever broken anybody's arms. Never. Yeah. Never have. Well, I haven't had no, no, no. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, my, ex my experience on all of this, sir, I never was, the 12 debates, and I include Obama, McCain, 
I never sat with a, with a candidate during a debate and thought this person was losing it because he was, he was too nervous or any of that. By the time you get to that level in American politics, you've been through the mill. And um, I think McCain's problem wasn't that he was nervous. He's just fidgety by nature. And uh, he also doesn't, didn't like Barack Obama. And uh, it showed. And I think, he, I think it, was, it was an indication, an honest indication, a realistic indication of his attitude about Obama and, uh, and just about the whole thing. And, um, and well, I don't think he was worried that he wasn't nervous he was going to make a mistake or any of that sort of thing. Um, and I've never, for instance, all these candidates, George H. W. Bush, George W. George Bush, George W. Bush, uh, Dukakis, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, go through the list. The ones that I've had, had close contact with in these debates, I was, con I was impressed with just how cool they were because they really do walk down. I could just describe it in the, in the uh, book as walking down the, the blade of a very sharp knife during, during that entire time. Well, that's what those candidates do. And, uh, and that takes some real, you, you gotta, you gotta, that's why these things, that's why they, they're, people can see these people in action do that. And I've always been impressed with them, every one of them. Doesn't matter what, I don't care what they say, I don't care what their views are or whatever, just the way they conduct themselves. Um, I, I've always thought, well, we're getting, these people are not accidents. You didn't get to be the Democratic nominee, the Republican nominee, or Ross Perot, or whoever. By accident, you, uh, these are pe these are people who earned what they what they had. Your your interview with George W. And in light of just what you what you've just said, uh, George W. Bush is is pretty interesting because unlike his father, and his his father seems relatively articulate, and George W. seems relatively inarticulate, if I may <laughs> may, may, may say that. But he you said that I didn't say right, that. No, I, and I, I voted for him as often as they would let me. But uh, it. Um, it but he embraced the process in a way that his, his father didn't. He, he, uh, he seemed to, at least in, in your interview, and, and he always seemed to, to do a little bit better than expectations in, uh, in, in the sure. debates, a little bit more at ease with himself and at ease with the, with the process. I thought, give, given that he recognized his own problem with uh, rhetoric and with words, uh, it, was, it was interesting that he felt as comfortable as he did. He was very comfortable, very comfortable. He, his, uh, the, the, you'll notice the Bush, his debates always had very strict rules and short answers because that was, he was, his long answers were not his strength. And uh, Kerry's were, were the, the, the Kerry-Bush debate that I did in 2004 in Florida, I really thought was a really terrific debate, just as a debate. But, but the negotiations, here again, I didn't have anything to do with it, but the negotiations, Kerry, Kerry's people were pushing to have long answers. Bush's people were pushing to have short answers as you possibly could because each one was negotiating to the, each other their candidate's strengths or the other guy's weakness, they thought. And, um, uh, and George W. Bush, for the only one time in, in all, of my debate, all of my debating, he, got in the, he, he finished an a, a question and he still had some extra time left. Right. right. Usually this guy's going, you know. They just keep talking, talking, you know, and then very difficult. And I, I looked at, he looked at me and I looked at him and he said, well, that's it. Now move on, <laughs> on to the next question. Uh, and the, the, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, timing issue, one, one of the surprises to me in the history of the, the debates, you talk a little bit about this, uh, is Bob Dole and Bill Clinton in, in 1996. The, the master of the short answer uh, in, in American politics during my lifetime was always Bob Dole, Bob. And, and, and yet he, he was unable to use that skill in the vice presidential debate uh, years before. He, of course, made, made a huge mistake with the Democrat wars uh, comment his, his his wit overcame him, um, or it was only half in evidence, um, and it's a joke, um, pun. Uh, but but he was unable to lay a glove on Bill Clinton in 1996. You know, and and you talk about the, the debates being important because they're a revelation of character. Clinton himself talks about that, 
And, and here's the great moment, it seems to me, that you could make character an issue in 1996, and neither Bob Dole as the presidential yeah. candidate or Jack Kemp as the vice presidential candidate could even touch that issue or, or seem wouldn't to want it. to touch it. They wouldn't do it. Uh, I had uh, prepared a, uh, all kinds of scenarios, because I thought that one of them would bring, I thought, it, first of all, I thought Bob Dole would bring it up. And uh, this, this was before, we're talking about the woman, the woman issue. It was before uh, Monica Lewinsky, but after Jennifer Flowers, and there had already, there had already been some discussion about the fact that President Clinton uh, had, a, uh, had an affection for members of the opposite sex. And, uh, uh, really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, things get around, you know how these games go. But at any rate, um, I was prepared for, uh, because it, when the first debate between uh, Dole and uh, Clinton, Clinton had a huge lead over Dole. And I started thinking, okay, the, these people, the, something's got to happen in the first 20 minutes of this first debate or it's over for Dole. And the only play thing that can, that's there for Dole to do is really rip, a, rip, rip into Clinton about the, the character issue. It'd be hard to do, but if he, if, he, if he could do it. So I had worked out all kinds of things. Well, that it, I, th I even thought it was possible that Dole would say at the first go around, you know, one minute this, two, no, let's forget the, the rules. I just want to say something about the character of, of, of Bill Clinton, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and I'm, I'm figuring out what I would do and all that sort of stuff. Well, he went just, you know, everybody's right on time. 20 minutes, nothing had happened. I had asked two or three ways. I asked uh, uh, Bob Dole a question like, is there anything about President Clinton, uh, the more personal <laughs> nature that you think disqualifies him for praying to be president. No, 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 no. Oh, he said something about he eats too much or something like that. I mean, no, I thought, oh, God. And, and uh, then when I did Kemp the next week, and I because because the Republicans ripped into Dole for, for staying away from Clinton. And the first question I asked uh, Jack Kemp, I said, well, now, I, President, I mean, uh, Senator Dole was criticized for not for not saying anything about the about uh, President Clinton. Um, uh, what what do you have to say about it? Or something? And he said, Oh no, no, we're not going to get into that. And the issue went away. Yeah. And um, it was uh, it, it, it was an interesting thing I mean, because they they both they both said it and did it. Uh, they said as a matter of principle. They just didn't want to uh, get personal. Right. And, uh, right. Well, and it's interesting because uh, uh, one of the things that came out from your interview with Bob Dole was how much that 1976 campaign had hurt him. Like how he had felt like he was the hatchet man sent out by the Ford campaign to to attack character, and and he felt like he was. That actually, that Democrat war line came from a Ford briefing book for Dole, like Dole was fed okay. that and, and used it. Uh, he chose to use it, but it, it's one of those things that I think he didn't want to be that. I, I think he was very self-conscious about. He know, really was. And he, the other thing uh, he said to me was in that interview that he said, I really felt uncomfortable. He said, I had, you know, I had, I had fought in World War II. Right. You know, I've been wounded. And, and it just, I don't know what, why I did that. I mean, he was, he, was, uh, he was upset with himself for having gone with the briefing book. But here again, it only, it, 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 was a, it caused a problem for him because of just, a, he was known as the hatchet man. Right. It was another one of those confirming things that Bill Clinton was talking about and hurt Dole more than it would have if somebody else, some other candidate had used the same briefing book line uh, against... Uh, and I wonder if that did affect him in 96 to say, I, I can't do it, because it'll just be, you know, well, that's what Dole does, he's a meme. He was very, uh, the interview with me, uh, he, he was very direct and very strong. All of these people were, frankly. Yeah. There was nobody yeah. who was playing games. It's extraordinary. It's a, yeah. it's a reason it to buy the book. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs>
Right, yes. right, right, yes. <laughs> but they, but they, they all came to really, they wanted to explain themselves. Right. And, uh, and they, nobody took any, any hits on the other one. Uh, uh, Dan Coyle was very gracious and very, uh, uh, he was overall, he felt he'd really, really been mistreated by uh, uh, the Democrats and the, the, the debate and, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the remark, the Kennedy remark. Right. And, Which, and, and your view of that, I mean, there, there are a lot of people now who believe that that was a completely canned, prepared remark by Lloyd Benson, that they'd, they'd done some research on what Quayle was saying about having the same amount of time in the Senate and the House as, as Jack Kennedy, and he prepared it, and he didn't really know Kennedy that well. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And uh, they, they even kind of rehearsed it. Yeah. Yeah. Although they all denied it at the time. You make this look so easy, the, the moderating the debates, but it's not always easy. I mean, you're back, the, the, the story behind the scenes of a uh, Jim Lehrer moderator, there, there, there are periodically problems like the uh, Secret Service trying to keep you from, uh, from moderating. Well, that, that was the hairiest experience I've ever had. I had in the whole, in the whole, uh, the whole uh, time. Uh, it was Hartford, Dole, and Clinton. I had, uh, they had a little holding room downstairs in a theater like this, larger than this, but a theater. And I was in a holding room and uh, uh, doing makeup. So I took off my coat and uh, I took off my, uh, my credentials. And the executive producer of the news hour was with me, kind of as my handler, kind of take care of me, make sure I didn't screw up too badly. And uh, he and I walked upstairs up to the stage. They said, okay, five minutes. So we walk upstairs to the stage, and um, uh, suddenly this uh, kid Secret Service agent uh, stops me and says, where are your credentials? And I said, well, they're, they're, they're in my coat. I had put them in, and he, he's going, well, and I thought uh, this guy was going to, you know, brace me against the wall. And this is right, we, we were right, I mean, I, they were already talking over there. I could see you know, and here, the head of the debate commission welcoming the good people of America to the debate and all of that. So I said to this 22-year-old Secret Service agent, <laughs> who was 12 by the time I got through with him, I think, <laughs> I said, look, there are three people that are really critically needed right over there in three minutes. I'm one of the three. <laughs> and meanwhile, my, my friend, my, the, Les Crystal is his name, my example, was desperately trying to find the credentials and get them out of my coat and coat pocket and all of that. And, and he couldn't find them. I don't know why he couldn't find them. He, was just, he just couldn't find them. And this guy was, I thought he was about to throw me in, throw on the handcuffs. And at that point, an older Secret Service agent saw what was going on, he came over and he said to this kid, everything's going to be okay. Mr. Lair, come right with me. <laughs> I went right there to the other side and then boom, walked out. I mean, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was sad. Then the Secret Service got so upset about it, you know, they, I mean, everybody in the Secret Service, including the, then the Secret, Secret Service then run by the Secretary, by the Treasury Department, Secretary of the Treasury called me. Apologize. Never. Then they had a new rule that they would give <laughs> photographs to the of the moderators to every one of the agents. <laughs> I mean, it was it was it was weird. Any any other moments? The teleprompters uh, collapsing, uh, audio feeds uh, not Sitting, working. Sitting uh, uh, in that uh, St. Louis debate with Gore and. Uh, Gore and, and George W. Bush, uh, we were about three minutes before air, and uh, suddenly all the audio's gone out of my ear. And I have a little earpiece here, and um, it went dead. And the floor manager, one of the floor guys, with the, cam with the cameraman, said, lost audio. And uh, I, said, he, I said, oh. So I said to everybody, including Mr. and Mrs. Bush and Mr. and Mrs. Gore and everybody you know, in, the, in the hall, I said, well, we've lost audio, so I can't hear uh, what the director and the producer and everybody is saying. And so then the guy said, well, three minutes. 
We're working on it. <laughs> so I said that one of the things, that, of all the things I have done in my life, the one thing I'm most proud of, I said in front of everybody, this whole kind of VIP crowd, to, I said, tell them it's not necessary to take the full three minutes <laughs> to fix it. Because if, if I hadn't had, hadn't had audio, what it meant was, even though they were, it was all wired they had, in terms of cues and all of that, that it is my lifeline just to know where we are at any given moment, total time uh, of, of where we are in the debate, total time each candidate's had. It's just, a, it's, it's just critical for me to have that. And, uh, but I realized, okay, so I'm just, I'm just spent, sat there in front of everybody, so I think, okay, all right now, okay, I'm not going to be able to hear anybody for, for 90 minutes, and how am I going to do this? And we get right down to, th they to two minutes, you know, and then they were 90, 90 seconds, and then we got, finally got to 30 seconds. I said, okay, here we go. And in my ear came sound, and it was like, the, all the blessings of the sun, the moon, the rain, the whatever had come thundering down in my ear all at one time. And uh, it was, and I realized just how precarious it all. I don't remember, I didn't, fortunately I was not in the debate. Remember the, the Ford Carter debate where they lost audio? The national audio for, 20, for 27, 27 minutes, 28, 28 minutes. 27 yeah. minutes, 28 minutes. And, and they, they just stood there. They just stood there. I asked them about that. I asked both uh, Carter and uh, Ford about that, and they both said, well, uh, it wasn't, neither one, Carter said, I don't think either one of us showed ourselves to be great leaders. Because they, they wouldn't even talk to each other. They were, they were this close, and they wouldn't even talk to each other. And, they wouldn't, and, and uh, uh, Edward Newman was the uh, moderator, and he offered them chairs, and they didn't want to take chairs. They didn't want to show weakness. So they, <laughs> It was, it was, it was really weird. That, that, but it also points up just how tense it ten, all is. Tension city. Tension city. Tension yeah. city, yeah. as yeah. President yeah. Bush said. Well, y y um, you have a second career uh, as a novelist, and, and you've written, uh, I'm going to get to in a second, your novel about the debates, but, but I do want to point out to our Kansas City uh, audience that y you've written about Kansas City a lot. You're, Absolutely. You, uh, there, there's, a, there's a great uh, novel. Flying Crows uh, that set, uh, it's about partly about a, uh, mainly about a, a, an escaped mental patient who lives for 63 years in the basement of uh, Union Station, the sub-basement of Union Station. <laughs> Actually, that person is here tonight, Clay. No. <coughs> Thank Chester. you, I thank you very much for um, coming. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, but uh, you've had this career, and, and you, you wrote what I think is actually a, a, a great novel uh, about, about politics um, called The Last Debate in 1995, I think. Um, and, and in it, it's, it's interesting. And I do, there, there's a question I want to tease out of this, but you have four journalists who are, are, are picked for various reasons to be the moderator and panel uh, in a presidential debate. And they decide, they, they become somewhat conspiratorial about this, and they decide uh, that they're going to basically deep six the campaign of a, a candidate, a Republican right wing candidate, who actually is sort of like Jerry Falwell on steroids. Um, and, and that they have to, for the public good, they have to engage in this conspiracy, which turns out to be a successful conspiracy. They do it, they, they eliminate him, and he goes off to some sort of music commune in Oklahoma. Um, but, I, my, Where everybody goes, by the way. <laughs> uh, but my, my question about this is, it, it is fairly well known that there's a generally very liberal bias in the media. I'm not accusing any individual of this at the, at the moment. How, how, but how uh, in, the, in the debates, uh, particularly when there are panels, uh, but, but for, you, for yourself as well, how do, how do you make sure you're fair? You have a reputation, a great reputation for being fair. How do you maintain that? Well, it's not hard at all, because it, being fair is what I do. It's being fair is what I am, but more importantly, that's what I do. And uh, it's, a pro it's a professional trait. It's what I do. And uh, I never, ever, during a presidential debate or, or running a discussion or doing an interview, I never allow myself to be judge, to be a judge whether or not I agree with somebody or I don't agree with them or I think that's right or I think that's wrong or whatever, that is not my function. It's a matter of function. It's where you come from. 
and uh, in terms of, uh, of, your, of how you see your job and what your function is. And uh, I have never had a problem, never, ever had a problem, seriously, of, uh, oh my Lord, I've just heard something and I feel so terrible, this guy's a jerk and he's a la 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 I just don't think in those terms. It's not, uh, my, my function is to provide that opportunity to the people who are watching and listening, not to do it myself. And obviously you're doing that pretty well, because if I understand correctly, there at least once or twice it's happened that the, the two sides uh, couldn't agree on any other person to moderate or, or be on a panel and debate except you. So obviously well, you're... That's what I said. People say, well, why have you done so many debates? I mean, you must be wonderful. I said, no, no. They just can't agree on anybody else. <laughs> So, uh, you, you, in, in 2008, you, you said you were going to uh, retire uh, from, from the debates after the, uh, the uh, Obama-McCain uh, debate, and yet you were called back into service in, in 2012. Uh, is it, if the nation needs you, <laughs> 2016? No way. No way. No way, Jose. No way, Crows Bay. Well, we'll have, to, we'll have to find somebody else to play Jim Lehrer's role, and that's going to be pretty difficult. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Lehrer, Lee Van Gogh.